Uh, <laughs> it's a unicorn type of day here on the Mass and Drum. No George T. Stag, no problem. I have a 2021 King of Kentucky. Been only trying to get this damn bottle for three years. Does it have a shot to be top bourbon of the year? It better. The King has arrived on the Mash and Drum. What's up, folks? I'm Jason C. from the Mash and Drum, and today we are reviewing, finally, Brown Foreman's King of Kentucky Single Barrel Bourbon. The 2021 expression is a 14-year-old Kentucky straight bourbon with only about 2,700 bottles available. King of Kentucky was established way back in 1881. Brown Foreman acquired the brand in 1936 from selected Kentucky distillers, and by 1940, converted it to a blended whiskey until it was discontinued again in 1968. So in 2018, Brown Foreman revived the King of Kentucky label, paying homage to the brand's past. King of Kentucky is an annual periodic release of a single barrel inventory featuring a barrel strength, minimally filtered proof presentation with each release and every barrel being described as unique. Now for this year's iteration, Brown Foreman master distiller Chris Morris chose 33 barrels to set aside for the limited release. This year's release comes from two production days 14 years ago, but a mere 12 days apart said master distiller Chris Morris in a prepared statement. Given the fact that each bottling is a single barrel, the very slight difference in age is undetectable. All the barrels that were selected for this year are of the highest quality. Now each year there is no defined annual volume as it varies by the barrels chosen. The bottle is a bourbon nerd's dream. The bottle is filled, bottled, wax dipped, and numbered by hand with details including proof, age, warehouse location, lot number, serial number, and barrel number. All right, let's try to get this nice and close to the microphone. Ah, uh, very nice pop. So, let's pour this. Hot damn, that's dark. <laughs> the 2021 batch of King of Kentucky is a single barrel cast strength bourbon. Now, proofs can range from around 125 to 135. It's 14 years old, as I mentioned, has a mash bill of 79% corn, 11% rye, 10% malted barley, which is the old early times mash bill. Only about 2,700 bottles available and sold predominantly in Kentucky, with a few in select Illinois and Ohio markets for a retail price of $250, with a secondary price commanding about $1,400. Now, for those of you out there that want to know my barrel stats here, what I have, I have barrel 12, Rick 7, uh, warehouse I on um, floor 3. Now it's bottled at 66.35% ABV, which equates to 132.7 proof. Ah, so yeah, and I gotta and I gotta tell you, I mean, just pouring this now, this thing is. I mean, if you've ever gone, I know I've said this about some bourbons before, but this bourbon probably more than any other. You go into a Rick House, you walk into a very old Rick House. I mean, you could call any property you want. You could say Wild Turkey, Brown Foreman. Heaven Hill, Buffalo Trace, wherever it may be, and you smell the combination of oak and angel share and whiskey all aging, this, that, this is the exact smell you get out of that glass. So let's try it, here we go. Oh my God. They, they need to make this into a cologne. It's, it smells so damn good. I'm gonna try not to like wax poetic here on the nose in this bourbon, but it might be the, you know, the best feature of it. But we'll get into the breakdown of it. I have poured a little bit here past the shoulder. I did sample uh, one, one or two ounces of this out already to people who've been wanting to try this one. Um, I figured why not give it a good chance to get some of the air in the bottle. Really open this up. I will say when I first tried it, the first pour I had uh, last Wednesday on my live stream, 
I was a little uh, nervous about the proof of it. The proof, because because it's 100 and, you know, 132 proof, it almost 133 proof. It was very proof heavy at first, but man, has this a little bit of airtime has really opened this up. I mean, this is the deepest, richest, like caramel, dark brown sugars. I mean, like I said, it smells like a friggin' Rick House. It's just, it's got that old like angel share scent to it. I mean, just a ridiculous amount of baking spices. I mean, you talk about nutmeg, cinnamon, like that rich, like, not just like vanilla extract, but I'm talking like fresh, you buy like a fresh vanilla bean and those vanilla seeds in there, that's what it, that's what it smells like. What's nice that I'm getting on the nose now that I wasn't getting in the very beginning is a nice, deep, rich red fruit. It's a nice jammy, uh, jammy notes coming out. I think it's more of like a blackberry. Maybe even like a fig. I even get some of like that charred, like orange that you get sometimes. Like I, I get it sometimes on even on Rare Breed, on a Wild Turkey Rare Breed where it almost gets like a singed orange. Like if you ever go to a, a bar and they're, they're making cocktails and they actually flame the orange a little bit before they put in your drink and you kind of get that smell almost the essence of like the the burning um, uh, the burning orange zest kind of get that in here too but I mean it just all wraps together and has this overlaying oak uh, that's there as well but the oak does not overpower it at all you would think for 14 years heat cycled warehouses now this is really kind of an experiment on what heat cycled warehouses and how they can affect bourbons uh, on a with a with a big age statement on it but for this one, you would think that oak would take over, but it just doesn't. The oak is definitely present, but it doesn't kill the, the nose at all. All right, let's taste it. Ah, the king has arrived, guys. Cheers. Thank you, bourbon gods. <laughs> oh. Oh, my God. This is, um, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, butterscotch, that buttery butterscotch note that I love in bourbon, I get it so much on here, like creme brulee, butterscotchy, Werther's candy, but wrapped up with like chocolate fudge, oak, a lot of black pepper. That first sip was ridiculous. All right. So second sip is when now the little bit of nuances start popping out of, of this bourbon here. For a predominantly low rye mash bill, you know, it's not too high a rye. You get a lot of rye spice here. Very, very, very tingly, very peppery, very sharp. It definitely kind of needles your the different parts of your palate. All I'm getting it all around the sides of my tongue. But again, more of that baked... Uh, like the baking spices, rich cinnamon, oak, more of the chocolate is definitely hitting the palate coming through. And now starting the, the dark fruits are starting to make themselves known as well. It's just like this, just this constant experience that happens on your palate. It's like you wanna take another sip, you don't have to. <laughs> I think that's what makes a good bourbon a great bourbon, what makes a mediocre bourbon into a phenomenal bourbon. It's the, the fact that you could take a, a small sip of this and just let it happen. Just whatever's happening on your palate, just let it go. Let it, let it kind of, um, you know, taste those flavors. Let it kind of react. Let it change, and just experience all those flavors. You know, the rye spice, the finish of it, and you could kind of sit and you don't have to keep going on sip after sip of this one. You just kind of experience the entire thing. Another sip here, man. For 132 proof, this drink's really, really nice. It does not overpower with oak at all. Again, more cherry now starting to the forefront. The cherry, the fig, the blackberry. Getting that more in mid palate now. Again, as soon as it hits the front of your palate though, you are just met with a lot of nice rye spice and that butterscotch, the sweet, the butterscotch heavy, that heavy vanilla creme brulee. Then it starts getting into the dark fruits here. Like I said, mid palate, fig, blackberry, Maybe a little bit of cherry too. And that's kind of intermingled with like some chocolate. I mean, I think I'm even getting like the, the, and then like right on the back end, you get a little bit of that orange spice and the, 
um, the orange cinnamon notes that I was getting to go with like that black pepper. Just ridiculous. When you're talking about the finish of this, this finish goes on for days. I mean, I've only had a couple of bourbons maybe that has had a finish this long. I would say the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, the old pirate bottle, the 139.4 proof, has a finish that lasts really, really long like this. Even the Russell's 13, I think, had a super ridiculous finish. Um, maybe, I think this would be a little bit longer than that one, but that one had a pretty impressive finish as well. It might be slightly drying on the back end with the high proof and the age here. You might get a little tannic oak on the back end, but I think what, what makes up for it is the amount of flavor you're getting on the finish as well. The cinnamon, the orange, the citrus, a little bit of like a leather sweet tobacco thing going on. It's just, it's so complex and takes you through, you know, a, a bevy of flavors here. So I'm really not gonna, you know, attempt to give you a final breakdown on this one because of the rarity of it. I mean, to gauge the value of this bottle, this is really only measured by the price that someone or a viewer like you or me is willing to pay to acquire such a rare release. I will say this though, for me, this is pretty much encapsulates the perfect bourbon experience. It really does. You have spiciness, you have fruit forwardness, you have sweet, you have oak, not overly done oak, it's very, very sweet oak, it's rich, it has texture, and you could, like I said, the the uh, kind of the trademark for me for a bourbon that's kind of unforgettable is a bourbon where you could sip on it very, very little bit at a time and just enjoy the ridiculous amount of flavors that you get. Um, like I said, it sucks that not everyone can experience this bourbon. Uh, unfortunately, it is very rare. But this does happen to be one of the few bourbons this year that was not a disappointment. I've been disappointed a lot this year. And I was very worried about this. And I was just hoping I wasn't disappointed, and I was not. This is a great, delicious bourbon. I'm going to enjoy every last little sip of this. I'm going to enjoy sharing it. Um, if you have a bar or go to a bar, if you visit Kentucky or anywhere else that may have this on the shelf, do yourself a favor and give this bourbon a try. This is a, a bourbon that everyone needs to try um, to you know, ch check it off their, uh, their bourbon bucket list. Um, will it be my bourbon of the year? We will have to try that in a blind tasting when I, at the end of the year when I put all my top bourbons in a blind. We'll see how it fares. All right, guys, I well, hope you enjoyed this review for the king of friggin' Kentucky here on the Master and Drum. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the subscribe button below. Please hit the like button. If you haven't yet, find me on Instagram, find me on Twitter. Uh, look for future episodes here as we get towards the end of the year where this is going to go into blind tasting against some of my other favorite bourbons of the year to see how it truly does. And we'll see if the king of Kentucky can come out on top. And with that, it's like I always say, it's not about the whiskey, it's the people you share it with. So cheers. The king is friggin' here, and it may just deserve its crown. Cheers, everybody.